Good evening, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. I'm standing in the backyard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden. We're in zone 8B here and it's early April, but I'm thinking ahead to summer. So if you watch some of my videos from last summer and if you're familiar with anything happening in the Pacific Northwest climate wise, you'll know that our summers have been getting warmer. We're in a drought. We've been in a drought for a few years and climate scientists are predicting that we will remain in a drought for several years to come and that our summers will continue to get warmer and drier and much more like what they're seeing in Southern Oregon, which much more like what you would expect as you move farther south, that kind of weather is creeping up here to Portland. The first few years that we lived here, I had trouble getting beefsteak tomatoes to ripen. Our summers were incredibly mild, lovely, difficult for growing those plants that require hotter weather. Last few years, I've had no trouble getting melons, summer squash, hot peppers, large beefsteak tomatoes, but we're having really dry weather, unexpectedly record-breaking hot weather early in the year, June last year. We're struggling with forest fires. We're struggling with uh, rising costs of water. And that means I need to do some reassessment in my permaculture garden. I did a little bit last summer and more and more I'm thinking about, okay, permaculture principle, observe and interact. I need to go through and observe what struggled last summer in the heat. What is the lasting consequence of those heat waves and of that drought? And how can I bring my permaculture garden up to a higher level of productivity and resilience by thinking about tweaking my design? Now, permaculture means permanent agriculture. That does not mean that everything in your design, once planted, like boom, it's just there, it's gonna be great and do fine forever. We are facing climate change issues. There may be all kinds of things that are changing in your landscape. So you may have your neighbor cut down a really large tree and suddenly 10 years into your design, you have all of this additional sunshine coming in that you didn't have before. You may have um, a high rise built next to you and all of a sudden you're looking at a huge swath of shade you didn't have before. You may find that there is construction on other properties around you that affect the way the water flows on and off your property. So just because we're thinking about permanent agriculture, that doesn't mean that the design is ever static. It means that we have to design a system that is resilient and can take that tweaking and still function. It can take that reassessment as circumstances circumstances change and handle us being able to swap in and swap out or move things around or make adjustments. So one of the big things I noticed last year was that my blueberries had a very, very hard time. Everybody thinks of Oregon as like the land of blueberries. Heck, we grow more blueberries than just about anybody. And we typically grow them in full sun. That's worked well in the past for decades and decades and decades, if not centuries. It does not work super well now, has not worked well for the last few years. Last year, garden groups in the Portland area and around the Pacific Northwest were inundated with this, like my blueberries are getting sunburned. Why are my blueberries looking like shriveled and pink instead of plump and blue? Why am I having all of this uh, foliage damage? Why am I having branch die back? It's because of the heat, y'all. It's because of the intense sun and unexpected early hot temperatures and the stress of the drought. Blueberries have shallow roots and they don't do so hot in a drought. So for me, as much as I love blueberries and I have a dozen of them, um, a couple of mine died last year and I've never had that before. It's fairly crushing to have a 12 year old blueberry up and die on you. And maybe there were more uh, attempts I could have made at remediation, more attempts I could have made at protecting my blueberries to help them get through that hot weather. I didn't have the time, I didn't have the energy, I had a lot going on in my personal life, and I really didn't think they would die. Thought I would get some heat stress on them, but I didn't anticipate it would kill them altogether. So for me, I don't wanna have that kind of failure again in my garden. We eat gallons of blueberries. So I'm thinking, what are some changes that I can make that are good permaculture design? The first one is I'm gonna go around and observe what of my blueberry crop was a success? What about the specific planting and location of those blueberries enabled them to weather the climate issues we had last year better than the blueberries that died? What about the situation that my blueberries were in um, that didn't make it? What about that particular planting increased the stress enough to a point where the blueberry didn't make it. And then I'm gonna do 
something different. I'm going to look at the success and I'm going to try and duplicate that. And I'm going to look at the failure and I'm going to try and not do that again. Okay. I'm going to do something different than the uh, particular plantings that were not happy and died or had terrible heat stress and are like barely hanging on. And then I'm also going to look at what alternatives in my garden did really well in the heat. I mentioned this a little bit on a video last fall. What did really well despite being in direct sun and having a low amount of irrigation, if any? What produced well and what didn't get bad sunburn? And then I'm gonna try and bring more of that into my garden. So I'm looking for alternatives to the blueberry that will do well in a drier, hotter Oregon. And I'm looking at what ways I can protect blueberries if I want to grow them. So those are two, a two-pronged strategy that I'm going for here protecting blueberries, looking for alternatives. Those are the ways I'm gonna tweak my design. So let's walk around and see what we can see. And then I'm gonna show you the two blueberries that I'm gonna plant and where I'm gonna put them. Now we're up here by the street, obviously. So there's gonna be some car noise. This is a bush cherry guild. And you can see that my bush cherry is just, wow, it's in full bloom. This is a Romeo and I get lots of cherries off of it. They're a little tart. And there's lots of support plants in this guild, including a rhubarb, multiple comfrey, I have French lavender, I have English lavender, I have coreopsis, I have rose, I have, um, let's see, blue false indigo, and I have native ground cover strawberries as well. And then you'll notice right here, I have a blueberry that I transplanted into this spot last year. And when I'm talking about designing for a warming climate, design, designing to make our plants do better in droughts and hot sunny conditions that we have not had in the past, we are experiencing the last few years and climate scientists predict we will be experiencing more and more in the future. This is a great example of how this blueberry here got some sun damage last year. You can see here and here as well. This was a mature blueberry that I transplanted in and it was very stressful for it to be put into this position and then immediately go into an unexpected, intense 115 degree heat wave in June. However, despite that damage that this shrub had, for much of the summer, this bush cherry shades this blueberry underneath. And so what we got is most of the blueberry did really well and it produced well, and it's gonna to continue to produce well this year. So I'm thinking more and more about making sure I have my blueberries much more tucked under and getting shade protection from larger plants within the various guilds. All right, so here's another example of a mature blueberry that I transplanted last year. It was large. I pruned back excess foliage and I tucked it in here. We are standing under my cattle panel trellis with my rambling rose over the top. This is an apple guild here. There is a large lilac here and there is loads of shade. There's a peony down here of some French sorrel, volunteer columbine. These are checker lily is just coming up and this shrub here this blueberry fits in really nicely under this area here and it is really protected and doing really now well we're standing in a pawpaw guild here and obviously the sun is going to come in this way okay and obviously these lower plants here in this guild, I'll get a fair amount of shade, not only from the pawpaw, but also from this peach tree here. And also here, they get from the black locust that I have here. This is actually a purple robe locust. There's quite a bit of shade here. And I have here a Juneberry. And despite the brutal heat wave that we had, and despite the horrible drought conditions, this Juneberry here did extremely well. I didn't water up here. I watered like once or twice when there was some potential for fire risk to make sure everything was uh, wet down very well. But this shrub did incredibly well. And I think there's a couple reasons because it has that shade protection here from the larger trees. And also because I have found in general, Juneberries are much hardier. They are much more drought tolerant and they are much more 
heat resistant than blueberries. And I want to show you an example in the backyard. So now we're standing down in with my golden raspberries and let's take a look at a little comparison here of failure and success. So this is another mature blueberry I transplanted in and it gets full sun. You can see here, this hazel shades right here, but the shade does not extend all the way down here in the summer. This is full, full sun. This blueberry got real cooked. You can see part of it is still alive. Part of it is absolutely toast and I need to come in and cut that back and just focus on the parts that are still living and rehab this blueberry here. But right across the path from it, also subjected to the scorching sun, also subjected to the terrible drought, also planted last year, is a Juneberry, also called Saskatoon, also called Serviceberry. It is a native. It produces blue edible berries around the same time as our blueberry friend over here. I got quite a yield off of my June berries last year and I did not have sunburn on any of them. Whereas my blueberries, I have not only had cooked foliage and branches, I had a lot of cooked fruit as well that did not look so hot. So for me, this is what I'm thinking about designing for a warming climate. I'm really thinking what is going to set me up for success? What is doing well? I'm using the permaculture principle of observe and interact and I'm saying I am noticing consistently my June berries do well even in full sun. Even without additional watering, they are not struggling and they're producing a yield for me. And my blueberries are suffering, not only the plant itself, but also the yield is suffering. I'll give you a little context here. So I have right here my Cydonia oblonga quince, which is just thinking about getting ready to flower. And it is a really large tree, one of the largest fruit trees in my garden. You can see it produces a substantial amount of shade. So the sun again coming in this way through the yard. This is the spot where I think I'm going to put some blueberries. I haven't had much going on here. It used to be a strawberry bed and then it got too shaded. So it's just been a place where I put prunings and kind of build up the fertility of this area, but I haven't had much going on. So this quince doesn't have like a great guild around it because it's just kind of an area in transition. So I have my hardy geraniums here. This is the Carolina allspice, which will get much, much taller. It'll get quite a bit taller and has gorgeous flowers. I have a mock orange back here, which will also get quite a bit taller. I have my Marion berries, which normally, if you've seen my old videos, I train them along here. Well, they got away from me last year a little bit, and as they grew, they grew up through this Gumi berry. So I said, you know what, let's just leave them and let the Gumi berry be a trellis for them this year and think about maybe using this space a little bit differently for 2022. So right now my Marion berries are over here, intertwined with my Gumi berry. So I have this bed here where I kind of have some decorative plants and some support species. Oh, I've also put some iris around, bearded iris. There's some thalictrum, which is one of my favorite flowering plants. These are some divisions I recently took and just planted. They'll get quite tall and large and fill in this space. In the back, I have a giant sanguisorba. Uh, I just like to collect them. I love the kind of feathery looking flowers that they have. So I have this spot here and I'm gonna put one of the blueberries here. It's sheltered. My hope is that this will be a location where my blueberry can kind of get a little bit more protection and we can avoid the sunburn issue on both the foliage and the blueberries this year. So here we're looking at the second spot where I'm thinking of putting a blueberry, right here. We have the protection here of this rose, of this hazel, of this black currant, of this clematis. There is filtered morning sun here, enough that my blueberry isn't gonna be overly shaded. 
but it will be protected here, highly protected from the beating down afternoon sun. So I think that this is gonna be location number two. So here is the shaded location where I'm gonna put one of the blueberries right behind me. And I wanna show you the two blueberries that I got. So I went to Portland Nursery and got two replacements. I get the smallest size blueberry I can. When I first started out, I actually got four inch pots. Um, the smallest that they had was gallons. I like to start little. I think the blueberries are um, kind of expensive and they are a plant that is slow to mature, but if you have patience, you can totally, totally get a smaller blueberry and hang in there and save a lot of money. And they do eventually mature. So I'm replacing my two blueberries that died. I got a Spartan which is one of the varieties that didn't make it. These are a like mid season blueberry and they make really large, good blueberries. They're great for smoothies, really good. The second one that I got, this here, is a Chandler. You can see here, it is also a mid season. It produces again, big, large crops of huge blueberries. I like a mix, um, both for diversity of um, size and also resilience. If I have more varieties, if one variety is really badly affected by a certain condition or pest, maybe another variety won't be. So I don't have all the same two or three varieties. I have, uh, I think, close to 20 blueberry bushes and I have no two varieties that are the same. But this is a good, like really, really big blueberry and it sets heavy crops. Again, really good for smoothies, good for pies because they're really big. So thank you for watching today. I hope that you're thinking about adjusting and tweaking your design so that you are more successful and you feel good about your gardening. You get those yields you're looking for and you're not facing disappointment in your garden. It is okay to make edits in your garden. It's okay to make adjustments. It's okay to say, this design worked in the past and you know what? Given the way things are going the last couple of years, this design is no longer working for me and I need to make changes. That's all good permaculture. Like, go ahead and make those changes. Don't feel that you are a failure if you are having to edit your garden this spring to prepare for the inevitably hot summer that we're going to have and hot summers for future years ahead of us. I hope that you will check out my Patreon down in the description. Patreon is how um, you support this channel and help support my family and help me be able to create more videos on permaculture and sustainable living. Thanks.